of our study of the letter to the Hebrews. We are working through this letter slowly. Um, it's not an easy letter to study, uh, as we've already been talking about, but it's certainly a very rich and a very beautiful letter. Uh, there's much for us to learn and there's much for us to contemplate, uh, especially as Orthodox Christians, given the fact that uh, the theme that I'm using, uh, or the direction or the approach that I'm using for the study of this letter is one of liturgy, right? Liturgy as the Old Testament to the New Testament, the Old Covenant to the New Covenant per se, which is at the very heart of the message of Hebrews, but also how that Old Covenant worship uh, that took place uh, uh, at the tabernacle uh, in the wilderness and then at the temple in Jerusalem and there were of course uh, not one but two temples maybe three temples depending on how you want to look at it historically um, three temples before the coming of Christ and then of course you have, have the priesthood, the high priesthood and then you have the great high priesthood of, of the Lord so we're, we're really looking at the, the, uh, the liturgy as the pretext as the context, um, uh, or even as the subtext of, of what's going on here in the letter uh, to um, letter to the uh, letter to the Hebrews, um, and it's you know when I say difficult, I mean it's difficult only because we don't really understand the Old Testament like we should. Correct. The more uh, by the author of the letter to the Hebrews is going to make sense, um, and so for example. Many people, when they hear about the salvation that is ours through faith in Christ, think of just the salvation of the soul. That the Lord saves us after we die so that our soul can somehow be reunited with God or with Christ in the kingdom of heaven. But it's not that simple. As a matter of fact, to state salvation in these terms is far truth is going. It's actually a letter that's written in retrospect, as we're going to see, uh, in retrospect from what Christ as the great high priest has done by having passed through the heavens and having been exalted to the right hand of the Father, whereas we're going to hear hopefully tonight in the text, he lives in order to make intercession for all of us. And he does this in the new temple of creation. So if we go to, for example, Revelation, heaven and a new earth, where the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. We read about that in the first chapter of the letter to the Hebrews already. Right then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned from her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, and no more sorrow, and no more crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the former things, what does it say, have passed away. Right? That's what we're looking at in terms of the goal. That's the goal for all of us, to reach this new creation, to be um, woven into this new creation as believing, resurrected, renewed human person. And it's experience of the new creation as temple, where God is enthroned and where he dwells and from where he rules. Right, that I'm speaking of how the letter to the Hebrews speaks in retrospect uh, about how this has all come to pass. Does that make sense to all of you? So we're looking at the end, and we're seeing how we got to where we are uh, in this very historical sense. One of the other things that we need to realize is that the new divided, yes, they're, they're divided from one another. And the division point is the birth of our Lord. You know, today we have this, this new nomenclature. Um, we have, you know, um, 
BCE instead of BC, right? Before the Common Era, and then instead of AD, after Christ, we have what? CE, which is the Common Era. It really doesn't bother me, you know why? Because the dividing point, the dividing line between the two is still hard, <laughs> no matter how you get around it, correct? But what the, what, the, what the book of Hebrews does is it shows this, this relationship uh, of continuity and discontinuity that exists between both the Old and the New Covenants. Continuity, <laughs> first in the sense that there is a historical trajectory that the one is leading to the other. We're going to see this in chapter 8 tonight when we speak about Abraham and Melchizedek. Um, but as we're going to hear again in this chapter, the seventh chapter, <clears throat> the, the new covenant, uh, it, it fulfills the old covenant, that the old covenant was not able to complete uh, what was promised by, by God because of uh, its imperfections, right? So, so that's very important in this letter as well. Uh, but we see this, um, this historical trajection. There's a historical narrative. And this narrative and this new earth. But the question that Hebrews is asking is, how did we get here? Right? How has this happened? And so we might even say that the entire New Testament itself, the entire New Testament itself is an answer to that question. It's an answer to that question. You know, even as we quoted earlier, at the very end of the Gospel of St. Luke, you have the resurrection account uh, of the appearance of, of the risen Christ to his, sorry, um, uh, Luke and Cleopas on the way to Emmaus. And he says to them, uh, don't you know what was written and what was prophesied uh, by all of the uh, prophetic oracles, how the Son of Man um, was going to be crucified and betrayed uh, and crucified and on the third day rise again. And then he, he himself even says, uh, he says this, for the law and the prophets, right? So here we are again at the end of the story. And what is the Lord himself doing? He's doing this retrospection, right? Saying, here's how all of this makes sense. Very often, I, I will hear people, you know, on the outside of the church, you know, professors, authors, Richard Dawkins, for example, they'll read the Old Testament, they'll even read the New Testament, and they don't have very complimentary things to say about it. Uh, because what we're saying it is that Unless we interpret the Old Testament in light of the new and the coming of the Messiah, and especially from within the life of the church, what's going to happen? We're not going to be able to make any sense of it. It's just going to be, it's just going to be madness. So that's our, that's our little preface tonight. So let's jump into our, let's jump into the text itself, and we'll start with um, chapter 7. <coughs> For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, that Abraham returning from the slaughter. So here we have an allusion <coughs> to which book in the Old Testament? Genesis. The book of Genesis. Genesis. And what had taken place was that Abraham had these relatives who were stolen by these, by these kings, by these raiders. And uh, according to the scriptures, I think there were 312 of them, correct? Right. Um, and when we get to the the feast of the first ecumenical council, uh, the first ecumenical council was uh, reportedly attended by 312 persons. So they actually make a, another typology uh, there, which is which I find kind of kind of interesting. So Abraham takes his um, his relatives, and he goes out and he has to fight for them. Right? He has to fight for his family and he slaughters them. This gets us to one of those, those difficult parts of the Bible. We touched about this before. Remember at this point in the history of Israel, 
that it was tribal, literally. Unfortunately, still even today, it is very often, um, it is very often um, oh, uh, the situation that it is kill or be killed. So there's kind of a defensive, there's a, def there's a defensive posture. Um, and so Abraham returns uh, from this very difficult moment, this crisis in his life. And it's interesting that in the Bible, that the Lord manifests himself to us all over the place. In moments of crisis, these are the points in our lives, these are the junctures where sometimes we are the most the most open, you know, to God's revelation. So we have this rather terrible event in the life of Abraham, correct? And, and um, here we have a great epiphany, a, a great epiphany of the Old Testament. And he meets Hebrew, they're, they're being raised in this um, Hellenic, uh, Hellenistic culture, <coughs> they know Greek. So because Melchizedek is, is a Semitic name, what does this, what does this uh, letter have to do for them? He has to explain it to them. Um, and we'll see this. But he meets Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and he blesses him. He blesses him. And he says to him um, that Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. Because Melchizedek was not only a king, but, but a priest. And so, it even it, it, in this history, in this ancient history uh, of the Jews with Abraham, there you have offerings being made through, uh, through the priest. He is first by translation of his name, King of Righteousness. King of Righteousness. And this is interesting because <clears throat> you have something very, very early, very ancient in, in the understanding of of, um, of uh, what a king does. What is the nature of a king? If you look at ancient kings, you know, during this time, during the Bronze Age, um, the kings or the pharaohs in Egypt, uh, the Mesopotamian kings, the Persian kings, the, the, the Hittite kings, what was the function of the king? The function of the king was to be a lawgiver. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He was the one who described the law. And you can't give the law unless it's presupposed by righteousness, by this sense of, of, a, of a division between what is right and, and what is wrong. Right? Even in Mesopotamia, you know, you you have this very famous um, discovery uh, in the Middle East. How many, how many of you have heard of it? The Code of Hammurabi. And, and <clears throat> when they discovered this code and, and translated it, um, I think it was, uh, was it Sumerian? I can't remember what, which language it was, it was, it was written, originally <laughs> written in. What they realized is, <clears throat> is that seven or eight uh, of those um, ethical laws that were contained in this code of, him, of Hammurabi were almost to the word the same of what? The Ten Commandments. Isn't that fascinating? Mm -hmm. If we read it, maybe I'll dig it out and we'll look at the code of Hammurabi. But kings legislated the law and they did that because from the person of the king, you, you found the very, you understood the very nature of, of righteousness. So, he is the king of righteousness, right? He's the king of righteousness. And then it goes on and says that he is also the king of... So here you have a Semitic word, Salem. The word in, in Hebrew is shalom, right, for peace. And 
who knows what the word in Arabic is, modern Arabic for peace. Something similar. You have Salem, Shalom, and in Arabic you have Salam. Right? Have you heard that? Salam. So it's a similar, it's a similar thing. And then we have this rather interesting depiction or description. Because Ater, it means without father. Without father. Because every anytime you put the prefix a or alpha in front of a word, what do you do it? What do you, what happens in the Greek? You negate it. Right? Amite. Without mother. Or mother less. Fatherless, right? Without genealogy. So, what's interesting is that the book of Hebrews, the author, Apollos or whoever it was, is not inventing this at his time. There was, uh, during that day, during that time, during that era, among the Jews themselves, this understanding about how Melchizedek, this figure in the Old Testament, was a semi-divine figure. And so he's just borrowing these ideas that, that are out there. Matter of fact, they had translated even uh, uh, a passage from one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, which, which what do we say about this in, in the Orthodox Church? How do we read this passage? Um, it's found in Genesis chapter 13 or 14, I can't remember, um, first of all, and then this passage in the letter to the Hebrews. How do we understand this? We understand this as being a prefiguration of the second person of the Holy Trinity. Can we say that it's a prefiguration of Jesus Christ? We can, but we would be biblically, we would be inaccurate. Because the Christ has not yet been born. But there is the wisdom, the word, and the power of God. And so it is this second person of the Holy Trinity, the wisdom of God, the Sophia Tutheu, who even during this historical era before the coming of Christ, is already making himself known through these epiphanies, through these appearances. Follow me? And this is one of the great epiphanies that is made. You know, blessing Abraham and receiving the tithe, receiving the offering that Abraham is making. So this is a very, a very important text for us. Um, and it's one of the ways that uh, the letter to the Hebrews also affirms the, 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 um, the divinity uh, of the Son of God. We can speak about this in, in dogmatic language. We can say that, you know, the Son of the Father is begotten before the beginning of time. Why do we say that? We even sing about it in the hymns of the church. <clears throat> because it's right there. Amiter apater. Right? Without mother, without father. Meaning that he is, um, uh, uh, he has this eternal, he has this eternal, this eternal being. So that, that's very important. See what I'm saying? It's very important. Um, so it speaks of this kind of, this high, this high Christology. Um, he has neither beginning of days, right? But resembling the Son of God, he continues as a priest forever. So what the letter to the Hebrews is saying is that the second person of the Holy Trinity in relation to his father is acting even as a priest who offers something, who offers something. He's already offering himself even in this eternal mystical sense. But the son has to return to the father for one reason. Because this is the way, even as a human being, that the Son offers himself back to the Father. Because this is the mystery of Trinitarian love. And this is why we say that the Lord, the Son of God, 
is from all eternity, as it says here, a priest. Because what does a priest do by nature? The priest is the one who offers. So is this, there's this eternal giving back to the Father. Um, even before the incarnation. <coughs> because in the Trinity, you have this perfection of, of love. The Father, by nature, begets his Son eternally. And from the Father proceeds the Holy Spirit eternally. See what I'm saying? And because the Son and the Spirit love the Father, whose very being is love, because he begets his Son, and from him the, 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 there is the procession of the Holy Spirit, because of this love, they offer themselves back to the Father. <coughs> so there's this, this priestly mystery that lies even at the heart uh, of our, our Trinitarian understanding. Um, and this is, of course, uh, what, is, what is implied. So it's, it's, very, it's very deep and very beautiful. We also have the tithe. All of you know what a tithe percent of all that we have back to God. But what many people do not understand is, is that it doesn't simply mean, it's not just kind of this legalistic thing. It doesn't mean, okay, I'm gonna lay out all my, all my money on the table and I'm gonna divide it into tenths and I get nine and, and the Lord gets one, right? What does it mean? It, it means that by giving the Lord, the first of the only. If I give God the first of my of my um, of my uh, uh, gifts, everything, then all of it is what sanctified. Does that make Does that make sense to you? The whole thing is is blessed by God. Um, by that. <coughs> that tenth that's given. And, you know, in the Old Testament, too, you know, we have through the prophets, you know, how the people, <laughs> they're, they're trying to escape, you know, this, this clause. You know, they, they're giving back to him, you know, not the very best, but what? The worst, <laughs> you know, of, of what they own. So you, you kind of have that interesting dynamic going on as well. Um, so, let's see, we're missing, oh yeah, that's because this thing, uh, yeah. right? Who? Melchizedek. Melchizedek. So, Hebrews is lifting up this figure of Melchizedek saying, see how great he is, see how unique he is within this Old <coughs> Testament story. <coughs> Abraham, the patriarch, gave him a tithe of the spoils. Now, why would Abraham be spoken of here? Because it's from Abraham that you have the entire people of God. There is no Israel without, without Abraham. The whole tradition that's passed on from Abraham uh, into the cultic life of Israel because uh, the people are coming to the temple or they're coming to the shrines sometimes, right? You have uh, Shiloh and Hebron uh, as well. And they're making these offerings, these, these tithes, to who? The Levitical priesthood. So what's, what's Hebrews doing us here, for us here? There's a little reminding that's going on. We have to hear the story again in order to understand the, the Who has not their genealogy, what does that mean? He's not there. He's before Abraham. See? The argument? He's saying that Melchizedek predates Abraham. Right? So this man who has not their genealogy receives tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. So there's another indication or another pointer to as who this that the inferior is blessed by the superior. 
Here tithes are received by mortal men, meaning the tithes are received by the Levitical priests in the temple, for example. There, by one of whom it testifies that he what? He lives. And this is really one of the, the themes, the arguments. Right here, finally, we've got to it. It is dis it's beyond dispute. It's self-evident. That's what he's saying. It's self-using that phrase a lot. What are the things that are self-evident? Do we need to argue or have a debate about doing virtuous things? No. Right? There are certain things that are self-evident. Right? They, they, they just prove by themselves that they're beautiful, good, and holy, and true. Unless you're really delusional. And that happens too. You know what I mean? There's some, there's some, there's some delusion up there, I think. But it's evident. One might even say that Levi himself. I like this verse, by the way. Very creative. Very creative. Very rich. One might even say that Levi himself will receive tithes. Paid tithes to Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Right? So, who was Levi in relationship to Abraham? Who can tell me? Was great grandson. Levi was one of the twelve sons of Jacob. Right. Yeah. Of Jacob. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. And what was the unique vocation of the Levites? Priest. You know, priestly priests. Right, priestly. But in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Numbers, they, they, they do show that, you know, you have this idealized history that takes place. That when the, the people of Israel um, and Canaan, they take possession of it. And how many tribes take those territories? Twelve? No. no. Eleven. And because the tribe of Levi, they have no territory, right? They become the guardians of the temple. They are the priestly, they are the priestly, priestly people. See what I'm saying? So we have something going on here uh, already. Um, and uh, I kind of like to say scientifically, biologically. DNA is in the DNA. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say the same thing. Genetically, mm -hmm. right? Genetically, he is already there. You know, it, it's really fascinating. If, if you read a little bit about historical, you know, DNA, we, we're all one. We are all one, really, in, in even our, our genome. The human genome is, is, is a single genome. And what makes us unique in terms of even our just personal characteristics is minuscule uh, on, that, on that genome. I don't remember uh, how, how, they, <coughs> how they do it. But by the time you get to you, even your family, you, you can see how much, you know, you can see how much um, even genetically we have, we have it in common. And then you can do either, you know, you can either do the, 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 the regular DNA, I forgot what the name of it is, um, I'm a little slow, might knock this cold, uh, but uh, you have mitochondrial DNA. That's my favorite DNA, because it's the it's DNA. What's that mean? Through the mother. Through the mother. It's through the mom. <clears throat> so that, you know, every daughter receives the exact same Right? DNA uh, from her mother. Generation after generation after generation after generation. Unless there has been, yes, some kind of a mutation. And it's through the mutations that they can actually trace back and, and discover, you know, what these various junctures, you know, these various junctures are. Um, as a little aside, uh, it was about 20 years ago that they discovered the remains of the royal family of the Romanov dynasty. 
and um, most of you know what had happened to them. They were shot, they were executed, you know, and um, the, uh, uh, the Bolsheviks um, threw them into a pit and burned them and, and it just tried to destroy them and then they, they took the bodies and they buried them uh, under a road. And they finally discovered most of the bodies. I think they, they're still missing one, one of the daughters perhaps. I can't remember exactly. Anastasia. Yeah, Anastasia maybe, yes. But they did, uh, the, the way that they were able to um, verify that these were the, the, the bodies of, of this last Romanov family was because they took the, the, um, the, the, uh, the DNA um, of, of this remaining relatives uh, of the Romanovs in Europe. Uh, and, and they were able to confirm uh, that they are, they were the same family, you know. So I mean, it's a sad thing, but in a way, it, it shows that you know we are all, we are all one. But I, I kind of like that because, you know, in, in my family, I can, I have five, I can see five generations from from my wife's um, <laughs> matriarchal line. I knew her grandmother, and I knew my mother-in-law, and of course, I know my wife, and then I know my daughter, and then I know my, and then of course my 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 uh, my granddaughters and, and um, my granddaughters. So I like to I like to say that there, there's there's the same uh, um, there's the same uh, emotional thread running right through that right through that line because I can see how I can see their their personalities anyway. Anyway, I hope she's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> it's recorded. Right? Yeah, it is recorded. <laughs> Um, 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable, attainable through the Levitical priesthood. So here again is the debate. Here's the argument. What is the perfection that we're looking for? This is very Pauline. The law cannot achieve righteousness. Yes. Right? So, if the Old Testament Levitical cult would have done everything that it needed to do, then there would have been no need for what we're going to call the Reformation. They even use the word Reformation coming up. There would have been no need for another priest to arise after the Levitical. Um, for, under the, for under this priesthood, the people received the law. The other thing, too, that's interesting is that the, the Hebrews, Hebrews is going to make a connection between the king and the priest and the law. Remember I just said the king is the one who was the legislator? Well, the priest was the one who, um, who, revealed, the, who, who revealed the law. So the law and the priesthood and the sacrifice, right, and the worship, it's all, it's all bound up into this, this, single, this single thing. And so the argument is for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek. So it's a question. The question is, of course, a rhetorical question. We all know what the answer is. Because the Levitical priesthood and the sacrifices that were made were not capable of achieving this righteousness, for which for us is, is our salvation. Because we, we look at it in terms of we look at it in terms of, of theosis, correct? Um, <clears throat> rather than the one named after the order of Aaron. So here we have again parallels that are being made, the inferior and the superior, correct? For when, here it is, for when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change, what? In the law as well. That's something that people don't think about too much. What is that supposed to mean? Yeah. You know, this is why this letter is so awesome. What does that mean? It means that there are 512 Levitical ordinances that belong to this, um, this cult of the temple in the city of Jerusalem and the way that the people of Israel uh, come to the Lord in order to find forgiveness, right? in hopes of finding their, their redemption. Uh, and they, 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 um, 
they, they symbolically enacted that on the, on the Day of Atonement, right? But now there's a change in the law because we have um, the coming of, he doesn't wash that law away, he doesn't wipe it away. He fulfills the law. He fulfills the law. This is very Pauline, right? We are not saved by the works of the law, but we are saved by, right, our faith in Christ. Our faith in Christ. So the change in the law refers to how we understand the law, right? That the law is a guardian of, of the people of God until, you know, the... Um, until the, the, um, the perfection arrives. 18. On the one hand, the former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. So, what does that say? That those Jewish ordinances are no longer necessary. They were valuable at that period in, in Israel's history. But now that all of this has been perfected, or consummated in Christ, they are no longer needed. And which one of St. Paul's letters does he speak about this at length? Do you remember? This is where we find these good Pauline things. The letter to the Galatians, right? Maybe we'll study Galatians next, <laughs> right? But it's the letter to the Galatians that Paul also um, he, he, he parses this out, what this means. For the law made what? Nothing perfect. Right? The law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. You know, um, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And this is really the faith of Hebrews. <coughs> that our salvation is to draw near to God so that we can live in a perfect communion of love with Him, right? This is atonement at one minute. This is what our reconciliation means. And we cannot, I'm a good person, right? And if I'm a good person and try to do good things for other people, then that's going to be my ticket into the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, that's usually one of the excuses people have for not coming to church. Why should I go to church? I'm, I'm, I'm a decent person, right? I'm a nice guy, you know? Um, and, and so that's where we start to get into trouble because we're, we're using the same language here. We're using the same language. Um, but we have another means by which we draw near to, to God. And here we go with the argument that it has to do with this final sacrifice and that it has to do with this great high priest who is now the minister of a, of a new covenant. 20. And it was not without an oath. Those who formerly became priests took their office without an oath. But this one was addressed with an oath. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever according to the um, according to the order of Melchizedek. Um, let's see if this gets mixed up. Uh, okay. By the way, what psalm is that from? Psalm 110. Or in the Septuagint, it's Psalm 109. And this psalm is not only the psalm of the incarnation, it's the psalm of the exaltation of the Son of God, of, of the Messiah. And this psalm is quoted more in the New Testament than any other passage in the Old Testament. Right? This is one of those examples that, that we find of how um, a New Testament book will use an Old Testament passage in, in order to promote uh, the, the, the preaching of, of the gospel. Um, this makes Jesus 
the surety of a better covenant. What is the? Right? This is what that means. Jesus is the guarantee of a better covenant. And here we go. And, and Hebrews isn't going to uh, even let us off the hook in, in thinking that we understand what a covenant is. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. Right? Self-evident. Correct? Self-evident. Now, that was important. Because what were the people of Israel doing <coughs> during this period in the, with these priests? Making sacrifices. What was the motive? What were they looking for? What were they looking for? They were looking for the forgiveness of sin. They were looking to make atonement with God for their transgressions. Now, the motive is still a good one, isn't it? And it is a preparation for something that is better to come. And this something that is better is... And here um, we find again in this passage at least, uh, Hebrews name what that promise is. The guarantee is not a written code. It's what? It's a, per it's a person. It's a person. He is the guarantee of a better covenant. 24. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Who else was continuing forever in this same argument just earlier? Melchizedek. God, through him, since he always lives, to make intercession for them. That is one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. If we take a look at this one verse, we find the whole gospel. It's in miniature. It's just right there. Summarized uh, synopsized, it's all gathered up for us right in this one text, right? In this one text. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. We can only draw near to the Father through Christ because Christ is one with the Father by becoming one with the Lord, with the Son of God, we are reconciled to <coughs> the Father. And that's our salvation. It's very Pauline as well, isn't it? Paul says that in Christ, Christ, through the Holy Spirit, we are reconciled to the Father. That's all of Paul, that's all of St. Paul's writings, right there. Right? Or you know, one of other, uh, in Colossians, St. Paul says, um, he says uh, almost the same thing. He says, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Right? In Christ, God, the Father, was reconciling the world to himself. And then we also have this unique expression. For he always lives to make intercession him. So he's always living, right? And this is, of course, the declaration of the Lord's resurrection from the dead. When we speak to others about what makes Christianity what it is, what are we saying? That Christianity is founded upon the event of the resurrection. Because even during this age, we encounter not a religion, not a book, not a philosophy, right? Nothing abstract. We encounter a person, and this person is living. He is living. And matter of fact, it's not really up to us to encounter him. He's the one who is doing that first. He is coming to us. Um, and it is in hopes of evoking that we, we uh, he evokes a response. Are one and the same. An intercession is a prayerful form of sacrifice. 
It's a sacrificial prayer that we make for the salvation of other people. So in this one verse, we find as Orthodox Christians, the entire purpose. And whenever I teach about the Divine Liturgy or about the liturgical services of the Church, what is the meaning of Vespers, the meaning of Matins, why do we do what we do, so to speak? Why are we singing all of these hymns? Why do we do all of this in a certain order, which we're going to get to also. It's going to be really cool in the next chapter. Um, what we have to say is because every single liturgy, whether it's the Eucharistic liturgy or whether it's a, a daily service of Vespers or Mantle services, um, it is all this living intercession of the high priest before the Father. Are you following what I'm saying? We are already making this intercession for each other. That is not really our intercession. It's whose intercession? It's Christ's intercession to the Father for the salvation of the whole world. Because we are one in Christ. Our prayer is a single prayer. This is where we Orthodox have something very valuable to offer the West. Prayer in the Orthodox Church is liturgical prayer. And we don't say, my Father, we say, our Father. Right? Um, matter of fact, there's only one place in the Eucharist where we, we do something with the first person, first person pronoun. When we get to the creed, we use that. Who can tell me why we do that? There's a reason for it. Because we have to renew our baptismal confession. Right? When, you know, the creed is not really, um, it, it, it belongs to the divine liturgy, but its original purpose is baptismal. Right? This is what gets you into the church by confessing this creed. So we have to say it for ourselves. I believe. The rest of the liturgy is a single prayer. And it's not our prayer, ultimately. The Lord, the Son of God, who is the high priest, who is interceding before his Father for all eternity. It's really a beautiful thing. So we don't really think of either our personal prayer or our intercessions that we, the, the intercessions that we make for each other. We don't think of it in this individualistic sense. We see it as being gathered up into, into Christ and that Christ takes all of this prayer and, and makes it his own. So that's why I love this verse very much, right? Because this is where it all comes together. This is where, you know, it all comes together. In St. John's Gospel, this is what Jesus means when he says, you will pray in my name, and I will pray for you to the Father. Remember? Right? Ask in my name, and I will um, ask it of the, of, of the Father. So, uh, very important. And, of course, this belongs to our theme for this Bible study, right? The liturgy of the church is the liturgy of salvation because it has to do with, with the high priestly ministry of Christ. And here we go on. So, the argument up to this time has been simple. The argument has been, we are going to summarize for you the purpose of the Old Testament Levitical priesthood. It was necessary for a time, reconciliation, restoration. That wasn't its purpose from the beginning even. It was, all, it was only a, a, a guardian, uh, so to speak. It was a shadow, he's going to use this, this, um, this uh, phrase. It was the shadow of, of better things to come. So that was the argument, and now he's going to flip the argument on its head and say, here is the perfection. Here is what we're looking for. Right? Here is why the, the superior is better 
than the inferior. Here's, here's the argument he's going to make. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the, those of the people. He did this once and for all when he offered. That's the argument right here that you have a final perfect sacrifice that makes for an atonement. Because for the first time, the priest and the sacrifice are, are, are one. Before that, the, the Levitical priests received you know, these sacrifices that were bloody. Here we have a bloody sacrifice, but it's the final sacrifice because he makes it, he makes Christ our God. Where do we find that from? Right here. Right here. You are the one who makes the offering, the priest that is, and you are the offered, the sacrifice. See? And because this was the perfect sacrifice, it is the final sacrifice. And there is no more, uh, there is no more need to make this continual, uh, this, co this continual um, cult of, of sacrifices. Um, and by the way, for all is very important. Why is it so important that we find this phrase once and for all? It's so final. I mean, it makes everything right. totally final. There's a closure in, in the history of salvation. It means that God has done everything that he needs to do in order to save us. And therefore, who's, what's left to do? What's left to do is for us to have faith and believe in it and appropriate that salvation. To make that sacrifice meaningful and contained within in that sacrifice. Right? Once and for all. Once and for all. Here, let me, I can't resist. It's not even just Hebrews. Let's go <coughs> to the letter of Jude, which is only a single chapter. If you have your study Bible, it is page 1708 in this edition. Verse 3. Beloved, Jude is writing. Well, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, right? I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was, what's the next three words? Once and for all delivered to who? Saints. To the saints. Right? It means that the New Testament is closed. It means that with the death and the resurrection of Christ, salvation history is completed. In St. John's Gospel, the dying words of Christ on the cross are, it is finished. It is, finished. It is perfected. Right? He's not only finished with his suffering, he's finished with the creation of the entire cosmos. So there's the whole, you know, the whole there's the whole kit and caboodle. Now, why the creation of God still is continuing, right? We actually have a, a Protestant sect or a Protestant denomination that has a third testament, which which are who? Mormons. Yes, the Church of the Latter Day Saints and the Book of Mormon, right? There, there's another another revelation. But it's a Gnostic revelation, of course. We don't receive it because of what it says here. Right? The faith has been delivered once and for all. The New Testament is a powerful message. And it's also a good exhortation for us because it means that it's all up to us now. All that we have to do is believe it and live it. And you know, these are these are these are the promises. These are the promises. 
Matter of fact, in the fourth century, the church finally said that these are the books of the New Testament. We are going to accept these books as being regularized or, or canonical. And, and we are doing so because these books speak of Christ as his, uh, Christ as when was the earlier reference to this? Do you, do, you, do you remember? Right? I think it was in the fourth chapter where it said, For the Son of God had to learn suffering. Now, that I think it said, He was perfected <coughs> through His suffering. Right? And there's a paradox here. Because we're speaking about this high Christology. That as the Son of God, as the wisdom, word, and power of God, He is already perfect, lacking nothing. But as a human being, He perfects our humanity. He restores it. He heals it. He enlightens it. He resurrects it. The, the, great, the great high priest. <coughs> So um, I like that. I like that very much. Wow. <coughs> Guess what? <laughs> chapter eight. We're in chapter eight, man. <laughs> Do you see the argument that he's making? It, this is not an easy letter. No. It, it, you know, we have to really kind of focus on focus on the text, focused on the, the theme, focus on the argument that's being made, right? The lesser is being replaced by the greater. greater. The inferior is being perfected by the superior. The old is giving away to the new. And all of this is happening through one figure who is Jesus functioning in the ministry of the great high priest. And he's taking pains to show what this priesthood meant, what it, what it is. Isn't that beautiful? So, so um, let's just move on and then we'll take some questions. So he's going to summarize again. The author, he knew that he's taking his audience down deep. Right? He knew that this, this man is brilliant. Probably Apollos, maybe. Could have been Barnabas. We don't know who wrote the letter. But he knows he's making a protracted um, protracted um, argument. And so what does he do? He comes back to the thesis. And he says, now the main point in what we are saying again and again and again is this. And here we have it, the gospel. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of heaven, a minister in the sanctuary and the true tent, which is set up not by man but by the Lord, where every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifice. Hence, it is necessary for them to offer. And with this text, we have finally reached Revelation 21. It's the same teaching a new heaven, and a new earth. And this will take some time to explain. Because here we have something that many people understand, or perhaps understand, um, in a um, erroneous way. They look at of it as being platonic. You know, that you have heaven, which is the true ideal, and then you have earth, which is simply uh, uh, an inferior copy, because that's what Platonism is. Plato had this understanding of spiritual, the spiritual realms as, as being contained of these ideals, and that everything that belongs to the material world, including you and I, we are all kind of just imperfect uh, creations <coughs> from that original pattern. And that what is spiritual, what is material are but contrary, diametrically, magnetically opposed to each other, right? And some people read this in that way, and that's wrong. 
But what we're going to understand here is, is again, the use of typology and, and how we understand the spiritual and the material realms, heaven and earth, not as something that are opposed to each other magnetically, but that are actually intersecting through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's what we call a confluence. There's a confluence. And as a matter of fact, what we're going to see is how in the person... So there's a participation that, that takes place. All right? Is that clear as mud? <laughs> Is that clear as mud? Um, but we'll come back to this. We'll come back to this in, in a couple of weeks. All right. So let's let's take a few questions. <laughs>